What a, what a fantastic story, and that is our own, Scott and Lori Dowling. You guys just wave back there. We appreciate them so very much. Here's the idea. Our congregation is made up of people who have their own stories. You have a story. It's not the same as Scott and Lori's, but, but you have a story how God is changing your life and how God is transforming your life. We heard Jackie's story next, uh, last week. Next week, we're going to hear Glenn's story and, and Chase, um, uh, our children director's story as well. And so the idea is this, that we're all broken. And God takes this brokenness. When we recognize our brokenness, he breaks into our lives and demonstrates grace and changes us into who he desires for us to be. Amen? Aren't you glad that God doesn't reject broken people? Let's have a word of prayer as we begin today. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for the transformation that, that you have produced in Scott and Lori's life. And Lord, just thank you for the shining testimony that they are to you right now. And Lord, not only them, but so many more in our congregation who are being changed, Lord, not by a program, or not even by a church, but individuals who are being changed by the power of the gospel, who are broken in their sin. May you and your love rescue us in your grace. And we thank you so much for that. And Lord, I even pray this morning that you do a work of grace in our hearts. Help us to understand your word and help us to apply it to our lives today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. So I don't know whether you've traveled recently or not. If you've traveled by airplane recently, you'll notice that, um, uh, that travelers are playing a new game, especially on planes. And the new game they're playing is to see how much they can pack into a suitcase like this and how many bags they can take with them on the plane so they don't have to pay the $25 baggage fee. Right, are you with me on that? So if you see, maybe you're guilty of that. So, uh, so, so the, the, the idea, the definition of a carry-on has changed the last few years. It used to just be one bag. Now it's a roll-on. It's a huge overstuffed bag. It's a computer bag, and it's probably a couple of big bags with it. And so have you seen anybody get on the plane like that? And so they come on the plane, and it's supposed to be one carry-on, and they have so much stuff as they're coming up the aisle, and then they got to fit all of that into a bin, and they take up an entire bin themselves. Huh? Many travelers today remind me of the howls on Gilligan's Island. Anybody watch, the Gil watch Gilligan's Island before? Now, if you're young and you didn't watch Gilligan's Island, that was the, the, that was the story of people who went out for a three-hour tour and got in a wreck and never came back. But it always amazes me how much clothes Mr. and Mrs. Howe took with them for a three-hour tour. Somebody who has way too much time on their hands watched every single one of the episodes and counted that Mrs. Howe wore more than 90 different outfits that she took with her on a three-hour tour. I have traveled with people like that. Have you ever traveled with people like that? That they just love carrying as much baggage as they possibly can. I'm kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. I would rather get to the airport, turn in all of my baggage so I don't have to carry anything, and then I'm baggage-free the rest of the flight. Well, here's the idea this morning. Not only do we travel with too much baggage, but quite frankly, for many of us, we carry baggage with us all the time. Even today, I would venture to say, many of you, between the time that you got up this morning and you took that first step out of bed, to when you took that last step out the door, you grabbed some baggage. And you're carrying baggage with you this morning. It might not be a, a bag that's made out of canvas. It might not be a leather bag. It might not be a, a plastic bag. But today you are carrying with you a bag that is made of different burdens. You might sit back and say, Brian, I don't remember, I don't remember grabbing that bag. Well, you didn't go to a carousel and pick it up. 
You just simply carried it with you today as you walked out the door. Some of you brought with you a suitcase filled with guilt today. Others of you have brought with you a suitcase that's filled with fear. You're fearful, maybe of the future. Maybe you're struggling with a health issue. Maybe there's something going on in your family and you are, you, you are carrying this bag of fear around with you. Maybe you've been carrying a bag of depression with you for a long time and you just can't, it's getting heavy by the way, you just, you just can't carry it with you. Maybe you got a bag of grief, you lost somebody and, and you just, you can't get over it. Maybe you have a backpack that is filled with doubt. Maybe like Scott, for the longest time, you've been carrying around this addiction. Nobody knows about it. Just you and God. You're maybe even doing a great job of hiding it from your spouse, just as Scott hid that from glory. You see, the idea is this. Soon we're carrying around more bags than a sky cap. What if I told you this morning, though, that Jesus wants to free you from those burdens? What if I told you this morning that you could roll those heavy burdens over onto the Lord, who, by the way, is much stronger than you, and you allowed Him to carry your baggage for you? Or better yet, He just freed you, completely freed you from carrying any baggage we're going to dive into that the next two Sundays. If you're here for the first time today, we're in the middle of a four-week series that we simply have titled Broken. The idea is this, that when we recognize our brokenness, and by the way, all of us are broken. Sometimes we sit back and think, no, I got it all together. You don't have it all together. You're broken. There's something in your life that you are struggling with. And the idea of the series is this, that when we recognize our brokenness, that God breaks in to our lives. Your, your brokenness, your confession, your, your, your repentance, those three things open the door for God to do a work of grace in your life. Last Sunday, Brad brought a powerful message on grace, which is God's response to our brokenness. Because of Jesus, God the Father demonstrates for us undeserved mercy, undeserved love, and undeserved forgiveness. Here's the cool thing. Brad said this last week. You didn't earn God's grace, so you can't lose it. God demonstrates His grace in our life, whether we're good enough, whether we live up to these religious standards, or whether we don't. How liberating is it? To know that God continually responds to me with grace. You see, this morning you might have woke up and you've already blown it. <laughs> Man, maybe on the way to church, and I'm not prophetic by any means by, at all, but maybe on the way to church you and your wife had this blow-up argument, and you walk in church today and you're thinking, oh my word, I don't deserve to be here. God demonstrates His grace to you today. Maybe you're here today and you just got a bad attitude. Something just is not sitting right with you, and you're sitting back saying, man, I'm in God's house and I'm struggling with this. Don't worry. God demonstrates his grace to you this morning. Whatever it is that you and I are struggling with, God always responds with grace. Quite frankly, though, it's easier for us to accept God's forgiveness than it is for us to accept our own forgiveness. Can you relate with that today? Even though we know we're redeemed, we still struggle with rejection. Even though we are forgiven, we don't feel free. We wish we were free, but we just don't feel free. We're worn out. We're loaded down with a lot of emotional and spiritual baggage. So today we want to tackle that struggle. From God's Word. And so if you have your Bible, your, your iPhone, your iPad, follow along. We'll put it up on the screen. Kelly read these verses just a few moments ago. Matthew chapter 11. We're going to dig into just three verses today and obviously some other side verses, but we're going to dig into some verses that demonstrate how you and I can check our baggage and roll it over, roll them over on
on to God and experience the freedom that God offers to each and every one of us. Matthew 11 and verse 28. Notice this verse. It's so powerful. Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Would you read that with me today? Let's read that together. It's such a great verse. Come on. Come on. Say it out with me today. Ready? Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Isn't that a great verse? That'd be a great verse for you to memorize. Here's the first thing that I wrote down in my notes. If you have your outline in front of you, it's this. Life has a way of wearing you out and weighing you down. Life has a way of wearing us out and weighing us down. How many of you feel worn out this morning? I know the guys that were here past midnight. Come on, Mark, raise your hand. I know you feel worn out this morning. All right, I told Lori Metcalf I was speaking on rest today. She said, oh, my word, I need that message. How many of us feel worn out? Most of us feel worn out for one reason or another. How many of you feel weighted down today? There's a weight in your life. Maybe you don't even share it. Maybe there's a burden on your heart, something that's just grabbed your mind and, and you can't shake it loose. It's what life does to us. Often we start out the week. On Monday morning, we wake up with this energy. We wake up with this enthusiasm as if, okay, life's not going to beat me up this week. I'm going to be able to handle it. I'm going to be able to deal with life. And by the end of the week, even though we start with energy and enthusiasm, we end the week with heartburn and heartache, right? Or heartburn and a headache. Because we realize that life that week didn't pan out to what we thought it was going to be. We're trying to get ahead, and it seems like we're always helping somebody else instead of ourselves. I read about a boss this week who bought a brand new sports car. And he took one of his employees out, and he was so proud of his new sports car, and he shows the employee the sports car, and the employee just looks at it and says, oh my word, that's absolutely awesome. And the boss looks at him and says, here's the deal. This next year, if you will work really, really hard and you will meet all of your goals, I'll be able to buy a better sports car next year. Huh? How many of you ever feel that way? You feel like, man, I'm working myself to death and I'm not getting ahead. I'm worn out. I'm weighted down. And I cannot feel or experience the blessings in my life. Often we work hard every week and we feel like we've made no progress. But Jesus gets it. He gets how tough life can be for us. And he actually says two things in this verse. The first thing he says this is, life can be exhausting. Life can be exhausting. He says, come to me all you who labor. The word labor there speaks of exhausting work. That that word has the idea of being physically depleted, of being completely worn out. You know what it's like? You've worked a 15-hour day, and you come home and you're absolutely exhausted, and you get home and generally something happens. Those, Those days when you work the hardest and you're most exhausted that you work home and the air conditioner's broken, or... You left your keys in the car or something like that. You are absolutely physically depleted. That's what Jesus says. He understands that. That word is used, by the way, that same word is used in reference to Jesus in John 4 and verse 6 where it says, Jesus, tired, same word that's used here, tired from a long walk, sat wearily exhausted beside the well about noontime. The Apostle Paul uses that verse in 2 Timothy 2.6 because he says it is the hard-working farmer, the the exhausted, the the, the labor-intensive farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. You get that. Many of you work really hard. I get that. And by the end of the week, you are physically exhausted. Let's be honest, though. Often, it's not the work that wears us out. Sometimes work can be a relief from the struggles of life. You get that? You ever feel that way? 
I mean, work is an escape to get away from a struggling marriage. Work is an escape to get away from uh, kids that, man, they just get on my nerves. And I can't wait to get out of the house in the morning. Work can be an escape from even a personal battle that you are experiencing in your life. So today, here's the idea. You might be here this morning, and you are just tired. You're tired. You're worn out. Take heart. Jesus offers you rest. And we will see that in the passage this morning. So life can be exhausting. He says a second thing. Not only can life be exhausting, but he says that life's burdens can be excessive. Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor. And then he says, all you who are heavy laden. That word heavy laden is found only two times in the New Testament. It's it's found here in Matthew chapter 11, and Paul uses it in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 5, where he says, for each will have to bear his own load. Each will have to carry his own load. That word heavy laden has the idea of being overloaded. It has the idea of a great weight being dumped on to someone. I tried to sit back and think, okay, how can I visualize this? And I thought, let me just put a couple of visual illustrations up on the screen that illustrate this word. Here are a couple of visual illustrations. That donkey is overloaded. Do you ever feel like that? That might be Friday afternoon for some of us right there, right? How about the next one? Try to ride that bicycle. Try to carry that load somewhere. The next one's my favorite. I love this picture. Can you imagine? That is an overloaded truck right there. All right, so you get the idea? That's what Jesus is talking about. He's saying, listen, not only can life be exhausting, but sometimes life's burdens can be excessive. We're weighted down. We feel like we're... We're carrying more weight than we can handle. And let's be honest, sometimes people are so exhausted, they are so weighted down, that death seems more attractive to them than life. And they contemplate taking their own life. Maybe you've been there. Hey, that happens to all of us. I don't know if you read this past week, another pastor in California, took his own life. Listen, nobody is immune to struggles. Nobody is immune to excessive weight. You and I might sit there and we might pretend, we might put on a smiling face, and we might act like we have it all together. And you're carrying a heavy load. And no one knows or understands the load that you are carrying except Jesus. Life weighs us down and it wears us out. And if I said, thanks for coming today, close your Bibles, God bless you, go home, you'd just walk away and say, that was like one of the most discouraging messages I've ever heard. Brian told me everything that I know. Yes, I know how strong life is, but there's a second part to that. Not only is life cumbersome, not only is life heavy, not only is life difficult, but here in the passage, Jesus himself invites you and I to experience rest. Notice verses 29 and 30. I'll read verse 28 again. He says, come to me once again, verse 28, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle, Jesus says, and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Let me just clarify what Jesus is talking about. When he's talking about his yoke there, he's not talking about the yellow of an egg, all right? I just want to clarify that, that he's not talking about, I like my eggs over easy. That's not what what Jesus is saying in the passage. A yoke, rather, is, was a, or is a wooden cross piece that is fastened onto the neck of two animals and then attaches them to the plow or a cart so that they are able to pull it. I actually have a yoke 
with me today that I want to show you. This is a yoke that uh, someone gave me. Somebody asked me if I use this at home, and I don't use this at home. Actually, Gloria Garman, who passed away just a few months ago, gave me this. This is a yoke. Uh, what was that? I'm sorry. Put it on my neck. Hey, listen, why don't you sit there and listen to me instead of you telling me what to do, okay? I'm teasing you, Josh. I'm teasing you. Here's the problem with me putting it on. My head is too big to put, to put it in the yoke, all right? My head is too big. Thank you for that. So, so the idea of a yoke is that two oxen would be yoked together, and then they are attached to a plow, and the two of them pull the plow. This is an analogy that we don't use very often because we don't understand it because probably nobody in the auditorium other than me has a yoke at home. Anybody else have a yoke at home? I don't think anybody else has a yoke at home. You might sit back and say, Brian, I feel like I got a yoke around my neck, all right? But you don't have a yoke at home. So here's what Jesus is saying. He says, take my yoke upon you. Because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So we might sit back and say, okay, Brian, I'm, I'm not getting the analogy here. I'm not getting the picture. Let, let me explain two things that Jesus is saying. The first is this. You are free from the yoke or the baggage that previously burdened you. That's what Jesus is sharing with you and I today. We are free from the yoke or the baggage, as it were, which previously burdened us. Now let's explain the context because here in Matthew chapter 11, Jesus is specifically speaking about the yoke of religious tradition that was so pervasive in his day. There were 613 Old Testament commands and religious leaders took those commands and insisted that their followers follow them. And if that was not difficult enough, they added regulation after regulation after regulation on top of those 613 commands, making what was impossible even more impossible. Jesus talked about this in Luke chapter 11 and verse 46 because he said, Woe to you lawyers also. The word lawyers there has the idea of religious leaders. Woe to you lawyers for you load people down with burdens hard to bear. And you yourselves do not touch the burdens with even one of your fingers. So here's the idea. The religious leaders were putting all of these religious demands on the people that they were teaching, but they themselves were not even following them. So they not only were putting loads on them, but they were hypo hypocritically. Is that the word? Hypocritically. I almost said hippopotamus right there. They were, they, they were, they were hippopotamously, they were hypocritically not doing what they were telling everyone else they were asking the people to do something. They were demanding them to do something that was impossible to do, and they themselves were not doing it. The simple truth is this, that no one in Jesus' day, no one in our day could fulfill all of the demands of the law. Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 3, the law couldn't, doesn't save anyone. It condemns us. It shows us our guilt. The Jews were yoked, as it were, to a religious system that could not, that would not save them. That is until Jesus came. And when Jesus came, he completely and he perfectly fulfilled the Old Testament law all 613 commands. Jesus was able to do what no one else could do, and what you and I cannot do. Jesus said, man, don't think that I've come to abolish the law. It'd be so much easier for me to get rid of it. But don't think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I haven't come to abolish them. I came to fulfill them. And 
Paul said in Romans chapter 10 and verse 4, For Christ is the end of the law to everyone who believes. So the simple truth is this. None of us here today can fulfill all of those commands. And guess what? Yeah, we're guilty. The law condemns us. But we fulfill them in Jesus Christ. So as we believe, as we place our faith and trust in Jesus, we become not violators of the law, but we become fulfillers of the law. Man, can I get an amen? Isn't that good stuff? That's good stuff. That's why Paul says there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Not because we fulfill all of the law, we can't. Jesus fulfilled it, and we trust him. But those religious leaders were were putting a yoke on the followers that they themselves could not fulfill. I venture to say, though, that this morning, the biggest burden on your heart is not the Old Testament law. Maybe it should be a little bit more than it is. I venture to say that nobody struggled to go to sleep last night because you were thinking... Man, those 613 commands. I just, I got, I got 611 of them, but it's those last two that are just killing me. Nobody, nobody sat down and you're carrying this burden with you. Oh my word, I can't do this and I can't do this. And I got this big burden and I can't do that. Practically, I think we should be more aware of the command and the laws and the holiness of God. But that's really not the burden that you came in with this morning. And thankfully, it doesn't have to be because of Jesus. But that doesn't mean that you didn't come in here with a burden this morning. It doesn't mean that you didn't come in here with a weight on your shoulders that's heavier than you can bear. Your weight is personal. Maybe you're here today and your marriage is on the rocks. You're, you're really trying. Both of you are trying the very best that you can, but you just can't get along. Maybe you have a child that's just headed in the wrong direction. Her life is a mess, and she doesn't want to listen to you. You wake up at night burdened about it. Maybe you have a financial struggle today. It's the middle of the month, and your finances are gone. And you don't know how you're going to make it the rest of the month. Maybe you're struggling with depression this morning. You can't talk to anyone about it. You don't want to talk to anyone about it, but you just keep sinking further and further and further in your own abyss today. Maybe you're like Scott, and you've had an addiction that's been hidden for a long time. And you would sit back and say, I guess, Brian, this is the way I'm supposed to live. What is the answer? Here's the answer today. Cast your baggage on the Lord. Cast your burden, cast your baggage on the Lord. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, that yoke that's had you bound for so long, let me free you from that yoke. Cast your burden on me. Let me give you two verses, Psalm 55 and verse 22. This is such a great verse. Cast your burden on the Lord. And He will sustain you. The idea being, it it literally means roll your burdens over on the Lord. That weight that you have on your back, kind of just roll that over onto God. That's what the Hebrew word means right there. The New Testament has a, has a verse that's the equivalent, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7, casting all your anxieties on Him. Why is that? Because He cares for you. You see, the answer today for the burdens that we are carrying is Jesus. He's the answer. That doesn't mean that we don't need to go to marital therapy. It doesn't mean that we don't need to try to correct the areas in our life in which we're deficient. But Jesus is the answer. And Jesus says, give me your burden. Roll them over on to me. If you're following along in your notes, the next thing I wrote is this. Realize that because of Jesus, you are, you can be baggage free. 
free. Baggage free. Man, there's something liberating about when we, when we used to travel to Mexico as a family, sometimes we'd go to the airport with like all of these bags and just getting them out of the van and getting them up to the checkout place was a job. And there's something absolutely liberating of being able to turn all of that in to check all of that baggage and just walk away from it and think, I don't have to worry about that till we get to our destination. I just check that. Here's what Jesus is saying. Come to me. Can I be your ticket agent? Can I be your baggage agent? Come to me. Give me your baggage. Because in me, you can be baggage free. We're going to look at that next week a little bit more in depth. But Galatians 5 and verse 1 says this, Stand fast in the liberty and the freedom by which Christ has made us free. And don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. I got a picture, and I don't want you to think that it's blasphemous, but I, I got a picture that I think illustrates this. So, so, so look at the picture and, and try not to beat me up too much on the picture, okay? Here's a family that's traveling, and Jesus is carrying the bags. You, you, Notice a couple of things. Now, the man's still carrying one, even though I think Jesus was fully capable of carrying it. He's still a little obstinate there, and he's carrying one. But, but, but notice something else in the picture that I thought was really interesting. Jesus is not following them. He's what? Leading them. And so they not only are allowing Jesus to carry their bags, but they are actually following his direction. So Jesus is literally saying, Brian, Brian, give me your bags. Give me your bags. Come on, I got him. Give me your bags and follow me. Come on. I got this route picked out, and I'm going to carry everything for you. All you got to do is follow me. Because in Jesus, you and I can be baggage free. That's what he's telling us. And if that was the extent of what this passage meant, we could, we could walk away and say, man, that was deep and that was life-changing. But there's more. Kind of like one of those television commercials, right? There's more. Not only does Jesus free you from the yoke to which you were previously bound, but follow this, it's in your notes. You are now yoked to Jesus. You're now yoked to him. He says, take my yoke upon you. The theological phrase that describes that is what theologians, and it's a great study um, if you'd like to delve into it, but it's called union with Christ. And union with Christ basically is describing the fact that we are united with Christ. Jesus. Paul uses a phrase 200 times in his epistles with this, which describes this. Just a little phrase that says, in Christ. In Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away, and all things are become so catch this today. If you have repented of your sin and you by faith have reached out to Jesus Christ, you are in Christ this morning. Say that with me today. I am in Christ. Say it again. I am in Christ. You are united together with Jesus Christ. You are divinely, you are eternally connected to him. You are yoked with Jesus Christ. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And there's so many practical applications with that because when I am yoked to Jesus, guess who does all of the work? He does all the work. That's why he says, Take my yoke upon you. 
He said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. And here's what he said. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. Two things. Let me just give you two simple thoughts there. We'll flesh it out and we'll be done this morning. It's this. Rest comes as you learn of Him. Rest comes as you learn of Jesus. Notice that He's different than the previous religious leaders that the Jews had had before. He's not proud. He's not arrogant. He's not demanding. He's not self-serving. Rather, He says, I am gentle and lowly of heart. You want to know what that means? Read Philippians chapter 2, the first 10 verses. But Paul says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, though he had the form of God, didn't consider himself to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man, and humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death you want to rest, learn to gaze on Jesus. Let me show you one verse. It's, it's not in your outline, but let me just give it to you today. I've been meditating on this verse all week long, and it just keeps bouncing around in my mind. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. If you have your Bible, I'm not sure whether we could even put that up on the screen, guys. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. Let me read it, so just think real quick. So here's what Paul says. And we all with unveiled face, behold, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to the other. Here's what Paul says. Beholding Jesus, beholding the glory of the Lord, learning who He is, spending time at his feet, beholding Jesus, I'm what? I'm transformed. I am transformed into his likeness. So much so, Paul says that the mirror, he has the idea of a mirror there, that the image that I am now looking at in the mirror is not my image, but it's the image of Jesus Christ that's in me. Why is that? I am learning of as I learn of Him, I'm able to rest. I not only learn of Him, but I learn from Him. The word that Paul uses there is the Greek word methete. It's the word from which we get our word disciple or discipleship. And Paul says this, or excuse me, Jesus says, learn of me, become one of my disciples. As a disciple of Jesus, you learn of Him. You allow Him to teach you. He becomes if you know anything about martial arts, he becomes your sensei. He becomes your master. And you learn from him. You see, there's nothing more transformative in your life and mine than gazing at Jesus in his word. And say, uh, Let me say that again. That, that's, that's powerful. It's not my quote, so I'm not bragging on what I say. There is nothing more transformative in your life and mine than gazing Jesus in his word. You want to know why that load's heavy on you? Because you're not spending time gazing at Jesus. That load is heavy for you because you're so busy carrying the load that you don't set the load down and say, I'm going to gaze on Jesus. I'm yoked to him. I'm going to let him do all the work. And here's what Jesus is saying today. He says, you're yoked to me. Being yoked to Jesus means what? I can rest in him. My job is to depend upon him, and his job is to do the work. And we exhaust ourselves, and we wear ourselves out carrying loads that we cannot bear ourselves, not realizing that the omnipotent Son of God is right beside us, saying, Brian, give me your load. Give me your load and in my pride and in my ignorance 
I carry the load myself. And then I wonder why I'm wore out and why I'm frustrated. Here's what Jesus says. Come to me. That's the invitation. Come to me. He doesn't say, memorize all 66 books of the Bible. He doesn't say, pay your tithes regularly, which, by the way, I hope you do. He doesn't say, here's what he says, come to me. And as we come to Jesus, he gives us rest. I thought today, how can I, how can I illustrate that in a way that's just so palpable for us? And here's the best I could do. I'm a, I'm a 56-year-old guy that thankfully still has a dad who's alive. My dad's 82 years old. He's still alive. Godly man. Both of my parents are alive, and both of my in-laws are alive, so God's blessed us. I have an 82-year-old dad that whenever I have a problem, I have a burden, I can pick up the phone and say, Hey, Dad, let me just tell you what's going on in my life. And there's something comforting there's something encouraging. There's something that gives me courage. There's something that gives me conviction when I speak to my dad. You might be here today and say, well, man, Brian, my dad's not alive. I'm sorry that he's not. But you have a heavenly father that's so much wiser than my dad. And you have a heavenly father who's so much stronger than your dad. And you have a heavenly father who's looking at you today saying, give me your loads. Give me your worries. Give me your fears. Give me everything you have. Let me carry the load. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jonas and the team are coming back. Big Daddy Wee was here last night, and they sang, I think they sang all of their songs. But, but, but here's the words from one of their songs. I'll leave it with you today, and then Jonas and them are going to come out. The words are this, God, I run into your arms, unashamed because of mercy. I'm overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed by you. I know the power of your cross, forgiven and free forever, God. You will be my God in all that you have done for me is so overwhelming. Have you embraced the overwhelming love and power of God? Jesus says, come to me. Isn't that a great passage? Wonderful passage. So maybe you're here today and you've never, maybe you're here today and you have never by faith trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Like like those Old Testament saints, you're still trying to do it on yourself, on your own. And you've realized that you can't do it on your own. You can never be good enough. And Jesus is saying today, come to me. I've already paid the price for all of your sins. They're paid for. Come to me. And I would encourage you, where you are, we'll have elders and deacons down front. Would you come to Jesus? If you've never trusted him as your personal savior, just grab one of our leaders down front and say, today I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. That's where it starts. If you've never done that, start there. And maybe you're a believer that's just been carrying around a weight like a two-year-old child who, who uh, stubbornly will not let mom or dad carry something for them. And you've been carrying around a weight far too long. Would you come down to the front today and say, God, I just want to roll it over on you. I roll my burdens over on you. I roll all my burdens on you, God. I give them to you. You can do it where you are. You can do it here. Whatever God has on your life, whatever burden you're carrying, would you check it today? Check your baggage and allow Jesus to carry your load. Lord, thank you for the truth of your word. Help us to understand it. Help us to apply it to our lives this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand and let's worship together.